Good afternoon, everybody. I hope that um, lunch wasn't too good and uh, you're going to pay some attention to an exciting topic that I'm going to tell you about. Uh, this is the obligatory uh, information as to where the money came from. Most of it came from actually from this, uh, from, uh, this uh, program. I'm sorry, it's flipping over on the laser. So this program is uh, paying for most of what you see today. And there have been some previous programs, but, but this, is, uh, this is the primary one. And we are certainly grateful to, to NASA for giving us the, the, the resources to continue this project, which is entitled Iodine RF Ion Trusted Development. Uh, and I will tell you why iodine. I will tell you all about iron trusters, probably more than you were ever want to know or ever heard of. Uh, here is uh, my name. I'm the president of the company. And the guy that's actually doing all the work, uh, his name is Michael Tsai. He's a young PhD from MIT and extremely bright and capable fellow. And he pushed this project quite far along. So. Uh, okay, well, it, there's such a delay in this, uh, in this feedback that you never know if you have to push it again or not. Uh, slide uh, up on there now is uh, the, uh, the requested information on the company. Uh, we were founded in 1985, you know, roughly uh, 50 engineers with some uh, support staff uh, of the order of $10 million revenues uh, annually. And we are the conventional small business, not woman-owned, not uh, veteran-owned, just small business. Our core business is uh, spacecraft electric propulsion. We, uh, the, the, the flagship product out of, out of the company are whole trusters. Uh, and we, we have the distinction, or at least claim the distinction, that all the uh, trusters that are flying or have been built in the United States have a heritage to our patents and to our licensing. Uh, we make electrospray trusters, pulse plasma trusters, uh, graded iron RF uh, trusters, and that's what you're going to hear about today. We also make small green monoprop, or something different than, uh, than hydrazine which is uh, getting to be extremely important these days. We make, uh, starting to build various uh, space systems, such as uh, debris removal systems for uh, space debris mitigation. And uh, last but not least, we are, we are endeavoring for quite a few years now to develop uh, high specific impulse propulsion for CubeSats. You will not find us offering cold gas trusters. That's not our specialty. We will be uh, always focusing on, on the more demanding, more sophisticated electric propulsion for, for CubeSats that can actually get you to places where, where uh, some of the uh, more demanding missions want to go. Uh, the, uh, the whole trusters are uh, pictured in, in these uh, photographs. On the top one is actually a picture of a 1500 watt device uh, and the plasma emanating from that thruster is clearly visible on there. It's a xenon based plasma. Uh, it has a bluish tint and if you buy an expensive uh, Mercedes or BMW, that's the kind of headlight you're gonna get with that kind of a bluish tint because it's the same kind of plasma. It's a xenon based uh, light. Below it is a photograph of a 200 watt thruster, which is actually the first US thruster, hull thruster, that has flown in space. And uh, we uh, are flying it now on a couple of different missions. Third one uh, is uh, about to, to launch later on this year. But uh, the focus of today's presentations are these uh, RF graded ion thrusters. Uh, iron trusters or gridded iron trusters have been around for a long, long time, uh, since uh, 50, 60 years ago. Uh, 
they have always run, or more in the last 40 years maybe they have run on uh, Xenon and Xenon alone. And they have been of the DC variety. Uh, Companies such as Boeing uh, that started under Hughes is flying uh, 2.2 kilowatts, 4.5 kilowatt uh, truster, gridded iron truster fueled by Xenon which they call ZIPS, that stands for Xenon Iron Propulsion Systems. And just yesterday, they launched uh, a a Mexican-owned satellite that is all electric, propelled to to its geospacecraft orbit uh, by uh, a a larger device than this, which is uh, DC ionized. And the, the, uh, the, the companies, particularly Boeing, is pioneering this technology along with a company called SSL, Space Systems Laurel, uh, to basically get, make the launch of these spacecraft very much more affordable than if they had a conventional chemical propulsion. Uh, they, they make tremendous amount of savings by re- replacing the chemicals with the xenon propulsion because then they can put on one rocket, one launch vehicle, two satellites, because of the mass savings of the propellant. So that's what's driving the, the, uh, the technology in, in the larger sizes. But in our case, we focus on the small sizes where the uh, DC ionization is replaced by RF ionization. And that's really our, our specialty. Uh, it, we build one that is one centimeter in diameter. And that's for very tiny spacecraft, uh, keeps that size. Uh, the, the one that you're going to hear most about is three centimeters, about a little over an inch, and a seven centimeter that's um, roughly uh, three inches in diameter. And when I say the, the centimeters in diameter, I mean the grids through which the ions are extracted from this shot chamber, not the external envelope. Uh, we also have a uh, uh, parallel program in order to, 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 to companion program to the one that I showed you on the previous slide, which we call Lunar Cube, and uh, that, is a, that is an SBIR, and we are planning to send a six U CubeSat to the moon using uh, this particular truster. Uh, so why iodine? Why, why are we switching away from xenon into iodine? Well, the primary, primary reasons for doing that are, are ion, I mean, the iodine is, is about four times as dense as compressed, uh, compressed xenon, and it is stored as a solid, and therefore the tanks can be, no, uh, they can be made out of plastics, can be uh, completely conformal, doesn't have to have a shape of a pressure vessel, and cost of, uh, cost of xenon has been skyrocketing lately because of the aforementioned application in headlights. Uh, they are now getting, xenon is now getting approved for application in, in medicine in, and in diagnostic equipment in Europe. And all of these things drive the cost of xenon to a level that is uh, unheard of. And sort of the typical price these days for xenon is $30 a liter at standard pressure and temperature. So imagine a quart can filled with nothing, claim that there's a xenon, and you can pay $30 for it. Uh, to to uh, uh, equip a spacecraft of the size that Boeing just launched with xenon, the price of xenon is probably 2 $3 million to fuel the spacecraft. So cost is certainly one factor and not an in, insignificant factor in replacing xenon with iodine. But the primary reasons for the small spacecraft is the fact that small spacecraft are, are more volume constrained than mass constrained. And therefore, the storage of iodine as a solid is extremely important. Uh, on, the, on, this, on these photographs, what you are looking at is the uh, three centimeter thruster and uh, running on, on iodine. 
and you can actually see the plasma glow from within the thruster through the ceramic enclosure and that little blue dot uh, in that picture is a source of electrons which in this case is still blue because it is being run on, um, on xenon, not on iodine. And later on I will show you where this uh, xenon is replaced with iodine because we have now mastered the, the, the art of uh, fueling these electron sources with iodine. All right, so uh, what we were, uh, of course, endeavoring from the beginning is to make uh, the thrusters operable on both xenon and iodine. Uh, xenon on the left, uh, iodine on the right. You can see just by the color of the discharge what gas you're operating on. Uh, with the xenon, again, is nice and blue, sort of like the headlights. And the, uh, the spectrum coming out of the iodine is a little tinted towards the yellow. So after a while, if you start running these thrusters, you can tell immediately just by watching the, the plume what substance are you uh, running the plasma onto. Uh, so this kind of a system, in this case iodine, is what we are getting ready to put on the lunar, 60 lunar CubeSat to uh, uh, fly from GTO to, uh, to the moon and enter the lunar orbit. Uh, on the next slide, there's a, some kind of a delayed reaction to this. I will, I'm showing you what the performance is of that thruster that you saw in the previous picture in terms of power input versus thrust on iodine and also uh, trust on the upper graph and ISP on the lower graph. And you can see that this device will put out at its uh, nominal power around 60 watts, a little over a million, one million Newton of trust, which is uh, a, a more than adequate to uh, perform a, a, a lunar mission or even uh, uh, mission that goes into heliocentric orbit like I will show you later. Uh, the attractive features of uh, these devices, whether they are fueled by xenon or whether they are fueled by iodine, is the very high ISP. Uh, you can, ISP is a measure of the efficiency of the mass utilization. It's basically the thrust that you produce divided by the mass flow of the, of the propellant you're feeding into the thruster. So uh, a number like 3,000 seconds uh, uh, is, is about 10 times as high as you can get from the best chemical propellant to put it in context. That is, that is why electric propulsion is uh, being pursued so heavily these days. Uh, on the next slide, I want to show you the rest of the components that go into uh, into making up a, a, a xenon RF ion propulsion system. Uh, the, the primary component actually is, uh, is a primary subsystem within the, within the propulsion system is the, uh, is the power conditioning. And on this slide, you're gonna, you, you are looking at, at the uh, power processing that's consisting of four boards. Uh, the most important board is the one that actually makes the RF to uh, inductively couple it into the plasma and create out of a iodine vapor a plasma that then emanates out of the thruster and produces the thrust. So this board actually is, uh, is quite tricky. Uh, we have achieved very high efficiency of conversion from uh, DC to RF and uh, the picture on the side is uh, it's just a, a standard neon light that we light up by placing the RF coil next to, next to the xenon light uh, to indicate uh, uh, easy indication of, of uh, the working order of, the, of this board. Uh, uh, not the least of which is the, uh, the high voltage board, which is around uh, 12, 1300 volts. And we have to start from roughly uh, 13 volts uh, I mean, uh, 3 to 12 volts on the CubeSat and convert it to 1,200 volts, which of course is a challenge by itself. 
and all of that is encompassed in, in, in uh, the stack of these boards that are, that are going to be fitting into the CubeSat. This particular thruster will, uh, the, this particular PPU power process will fit roughly in, in one U, a little less than one U. Uh, it will process um, up to uh, 120 or so watts. And the input, uh, we, we are more focusing on the high end of the spectrum because at 3 volts and 100 watts, the current gets extremely high, and we are not recommending to anybody to run a copper bus bar on their CubeSats. The overall efficiency for the, for the PPU is 85%, which, again, is thanks to this very ingenious conversion from DC to RF that has one additional feature, which is auto-tuning. The, the circuit is capable of sensing what the impedance of the plasma is and adjusting the frequency to make sure that the, uh, that the coupling from the RF side or from the RF coil into the plasma is the uh, most efficient that uh, one can achieve. Okay, here is the rest of the total system. Uh, on the left, uh, you see the thruster itself. On the upper right, you see that power processor that we discussed a minute ago. Very importantly, here is the tiny little electron source called Holo Cathode, this time running on iodine, and that's why you see the, the difference in, in the color of the plume. Uh, this is a technology that we are just mastering. It is utilizing uh, an electron electron emitter that is basically a, a, a ceramic that is converted into, that is fooled by dopants to think that it's metal. And then without heating it, you can, you can extract electrons out of it. And it's a, it's a very exciting technology that enables these thrusters to, to operate both the cathode and the thruster on the same substance. So you don't have to have two different tankages on the spacecraft. The iodine itself, when you order it from uh, Alpha Acer, is, is a bunch of granules, metallic looking. Uh, you can put it in any conformal tank. This, this tank uh, is made to go into the 60 cube sites and, and hold about a kilogram and a half of, uh, of this uh, iodine, of this metallic substance. And, uh, uh, the distinctive feature of iodine is that when you put it inside a tank, all you have to do is heat the tank to around 70 to 80 degrees centigrade, and then the iodine goes directly from solid into vapor through a process of sublimation, generating enough of pressure, vapor pressure, to feed it directly into the thruster. So you don't need any compression, no high pressure tanks, no, no uh, sort of demanding uh, flow regulation. It just happens that the vapor pressure of iodine at 80 degrees C is just right to feed into the thruster and the cathode. So now I want to tell you a little bit about the uh, applications for the, for the missions that we are looking at. And this, this thing, uh, I should credit uh, a, a small company called Nextrack that helped us create these, uh, these graphs. Uh, in this example, it's, we are sending a 6 EU CubeSat uh, equipped with the 3 centimeter RF ion thruster running on iodine from uh, GEO uh, into a lunar orbit and actually enter the orbit because uh, with uh, this system can be uh, one and a half kilogram of propellant fitting approximately two use can deliver 12 kilogram spacecraft uh, from geo into into lunar orbit uh, because it produces roughly three kilometers or three and a half kilometers per second delta v so uh, without any uh, special uh, launch rockets we can even start with a little bit less, a bit little bit less uh, payload, or a little more propellant. We can start at GTO where rockets go regularly, 
uh, about 30, 40 of them a year, and then go from GTO to lunar orbit and accomplish the same mission without requiring to go to GEO. That is a huge savings for any of the secondary payload missions that all of these CubeSats go on to. Uh, the uh, next mission that in some ways is even more exciting is to uh, go into, um, uh, go from Earth orbit, which is, this is basically cislunar space, but we can go and enter um, sun-centric orbit and catch up with an asteroid that's going to fly by sometimes in October 2020 in the cislunar space between the Earth and, and, and the Moon. And starting again in GEO or GTO, we can uh, spiral out, meet the trajectory of the asteroid, which is in, in the red barrel visible out here, and call fly with the asteroid uh, so that you can, uh, similar to, to the mission, to the Rosetta mission that uh, the Europeans just did, call fly with an asteroid, they, they call flew with a, with a comet, and examine it with the appropriate uh, spectroscopic instruments as to what that asteroid is, take a picture of it. And, and in some cases, if you, uh, if you are really, really clever, because the asteroid is small enough, doesn't have very big gravity, we could even attempt to land on it with the 6G CubeSat. So these are the, the primary exciting applications for this technology. And we certainly feel that, that, that the mission planners will, uh, across the country and across the world, will, will take, it, take advantage of this capability and, uh, and, and use this uh, technology to, uh, to do missions that were previously attainable only with huge spacecraft. So in, in conclusion, the uh, BIT-3, which stands for BUSEC uh, Ion Thruster 3 centimeter, enables the very high delta V missions that I just described. I'll give you two examples of. Uh, people like uh, not only NASA, but also uh, people like Planetary Sciences that are uh, intending to, to do uh, prospecting of asteroids are very interested in these kinds of uh, in these kinds of technologies because it will allow them to go and visit various asteroids, scout them out on, on the cheap. Uh, iodine is is really um, uh, groundbreaking and game changing because it it allows you to put the propellant onto the 60 cubesat uh, in extremely dense state uh, without uh, uh, having high pressure tanks like xenon would require. 2,500 psi tank, and uh, put it on that spacecraft because of its high density into a very small tank, which is at zero pressure. Um, that, incidentally, is a huge obstacle for many secondary payloads, because as soon as you want to put propulsion on a secondary payload, the primary payload says, ah, uh -uh, you're not going to put anything pressurized on my, under my spacecraft. Uh, and all kinds of red flags go up and uh, range safety starts asking questions about your safety factors, etc. Iodine avoids all these issues because it's at zero pressure. Uh, NASA is uh, supporting of this technology. We are actually going to fly uh, something called ISAT with our whole thruster, which were 200 watt hole thruster, which uh, pioneered the, the application of iodine in, uh, in Arctic proportion. And uh, as, the, as the general awareness of these, of these capabilities permeates the, the community, we certainly hope that the mission planners will, uh, will take, a, take advantage of, of this capability. Uh, if we were to uh, completely mature, get it to uh, flight status, from this point onward, we feel that something of the order of $1 million will do it. Uh, we are anticipating uh, further funding through uh, uh, the super SBIR that NASA has uh, coming up on phase two, and that will cover most of this uh, requirement of, of additional resources to get it near flight status. 
we do have uh, all the facilities and all the talents to, to pull it off. And uh, with that, I want to thank you and for your attention and take questions. Everybody understood everything. Yeah. Yes, yes, there is a there is a flow regulating valve in the line, uh, but it's it's a very coarse, large orifice valve because of the low vapor pressure. The line just allows it to to turn on and turn off. Any other? Okay, thank you.